Welcome to Monster Chats, presented by Monster VoIP, where we share the tools, methods, and best practices that business leaders use to build new connections, strengthen relationships, and impact sales and organizations of all shapes and sizes. If you have any questions that come up during today's episode, please text them to 424-378-6966. Please welcome the founder of Monster VoIP, your host, Colin Mitchell. On today's episode, we're going to be talking with Ken Stewart of Sygen. Ken and I are going to be talking about creating marketing leading programs, building better teams with the end goal of scaling up and exiting a valuable company. Uh, my name is Colin Mitchell. I'm the founder of Monster VoIP and your host of Monster Chats. Ken Stewart is a goal-oriented leader with the responsibility for the hearts and minds of teams in development, quality assurance, product management, and compliance at SciGen Software. He graduated from Western Governors University with a BS in Information Technology Network Management. A decorated former U.S. Marine, Ken has worked with organizations of all shapes and sizes to create and execute market-leading programs, improve operational efficiencies, and unleash workforces to excel in their God-given talents. Ken, welcome to Monster Chats. How you doing? Hey, you doing well, Colin. Thanks for having me. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Tell us a little bit more about your story, you know, kind of where you came from and how you got where you are today. Absolutely. Yeah, I started out uh, deciding you know, back in 97 when I saw the internet really taking off, uh, got big, decided to join the U.S. military. Definitely not a conventional path for most technologists, but I had a real passion for serving my country as well as learning technology at the same time and thought it was a great marriage. So mm-hmm. spent four years doing that, uh, you know, really hard charging M16 in one hand, laptop in the other, right? It was good stuff. <laughs> so I uh, decided the rules were a little bit too much, decided to get out in the exit, exit uh, to the uh, private sector to learn more about uh, private sector IT and uh, did it exactly the right time during the dot-com bust. It was a wonderful time in technology where all of our mm-hmm. hopes and dreams and the web kind of blew up because everything was overvalued. Spent a number of years working for a manufacturing firm whose claim to fame was the first rotisserie oven in the world. They sold the royalty and all this fun stuff. Learned a lot about Lean and Six Sigma. Mm-hmm. Uh, brought in a managed print services provider, actually, to help with uh, rationalizing the, the, the fleet back in '01. And uh, they asked me to come work for them and build out their IT services and professional services organization. And was fortunate to be part of that leadership team that helped to grow the company, doubling the revenues in five years and uh, wow. built them to a successful exit to help the owners make a lot of money on that one. And uh, then worked for Fortune 500 company. Along the way, it had some real good advice during that whole process of really helping that company grow from my friends, Daryl Amy and Corey Smith, that I needed to build my own personal brand. So I started my company and my blog, ChangeForge, which was really instrumental in helping me get my voice out there. Uh, that helped me pivot into actually moving into market research, right? So I got to spend Mm -hmm. a lot of time with technology resellers around the globe, Russia, Europe, Japan, Uh, spent a lot of time with Fortune 50 manufacturers, helping them uh, really build go-to-market strategies and understanding how to take on competition and how to be successful with their partners. And then decided I didn't want to be part of the print industry anymore, Uh, wanted to get back to my roots and actually get back into the field and execute. And so I've been working with SciGen for the last three and a half years now, really helping build out a great team, working more with software that helps people automate their work. And it's a really great format for remote workers today. So that's my story. Awesome. Tell me a little bit about, you know, the lessons you learned uh, being a Marine and how you applied those to business. Yeah, it's funny. I think that, uh, you know, being a Marine taught me, first and foremost, it taught me willpower. And and it taught me how to basically take whatever raw material I was given, whatever resources I had at my disposal Mm -hmm. and overcome any obstacle. So it's interesting that the Marine Corps gets about 5% of the Navy's budget every single year and they give a percent back every year. So they're really working on about 4% of the Navy's budget and they do amazing things just with sheer willpower and tenacity. And that's really what most entrepreneurs and executives have to apply in their day-to-day business is you hear about that reality distortion filter, but you have to have a thick skin and this ability to be able to execute and just kind of tell people that are telling you, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to push through this. I'm going to survive. Right. I mean, that's what you found, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you're going to hear a lot of no's, right? And Mm -hmm. there's going to be people that don't believe in you as an entrepreneur or business leader. And, um, and there's, and especially in time like now with what's going on, right? There's a lot of negativity, a lot of doubt, a lot of fear. And, you know, there's the people that are strong-minded and have lessons like what you've learned 
um, that are going to make it to the other side of this. That's and right. Adapt and overcome, as we say in the Marine Corps. Absolutely. I love That's that. That's right. So tell us a little bit about, you, you know, how you've been able to uh, really engross yourself into creating these market leading programs and, you know, aligning yeah. teams with people. Yeah. So I think those are two really, th- two big things that I'm really passionate about is at the end of the day, it's, it's great to have one or the other, but without both, you really don't have uh, that, that true vision that's out there, that, that true human uh, element to everything. So with market leading programs, I spent a lot of time building programs for companies that were successful and then spent a number of years working as a consultant, helping companies actually execute their go to market strategy. And so, you know, obviously you talk about, you know, the typical you know, things of sales and marketing and operations and yada, yada, yada. But really what I found critical, there are a couple of key pillars that most people needed to understand. The first thing is you have to have outside in thinking. And, and that really means that you have to have the end goal in mind. You hear the saying, have the end in mind before you start. That's true, but I've also found that you have to be a little adaptive. So you have to think through uh, the concept of being iterative, being agile, being flexible, so that you know you're getting into a business case with a certain hypothesis. You're, you're getting in there following a certain pain point that is out there. And, and to build a successful program, you have to understand what that pain point is for that customer, but you also have to be willing to adapt and to make sure that you're pivoting and listening, which is where most companies are having their big challenges today, right? I mean, the challenge for most people with their programs is – They may or may not have been well suited to handle changes in the marketplace, but we've seen really just crazy amounts of change uh, pushed onto the market immediately. And you see companies that are succeeding and you Mm -hmm. see companies that are not. And and the ones that are succeeding are the ones that had a good, uh, good line of sight on what pain problems were for the evolving remote workplace. They use Mm -hmm. technology, they live in technology. But the ones that are struggling are the ones that couldn't, or that aren't pivoting fast enough, mm-hmm. right? I see successful restaurants here is another good example, right? Yeah. It, it, the ones that are being successful are, are adapting, doing curbside pickup, finding ways to be creative, mm-hmm. uh, keeping things moving, right? Right. So, you know, the, having the end goal in mind is, is super important is what I hear saying. But what's more important is being flexible and willing to adapt Absolutely. as things change. Yep. Uh, especially, I mean, nobody could have predicted the situation that we're in right now. Um, and people are pivoting quickly. Yep. Um, even yep. for us, you know, like our business model has shifted, right? I mean, we sell a product that supports remote workers. Yes. Um, but our, our model has shifted where we're actually splitting our time is trying to help as many of the unemployed people. So yep. we're putting together programs to train people how to sell a product that people need overnight and working yep. really quickly to do that. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's really fantastic. That's exactly what we've been wrestling with at this particular point. We've been at SciGen, we've had a remote workforce for the past decade. We've been 100% virtual. Mm -hmm. Uh, So this was not a shock to us. This was not a shift for us. What we have been inundated with, though, are the requests uh, and, and really just the obvious need that people have. And so that's what we're really pivoting into is how do you how do you be generous with helping people in their time of need? We had one partner that actually shut down the production of what they did and actually started making masks. I mean, so they took their entire workforce that was going to be furloughed and they shifted into making masks. For us, it's really about helping to educate people, extending licenses to people, a lot, a lot of like what Zoom is doing, for instance, where they're giving away a lot of free licenses and whatnot. Uh, that's what kind of what we're working through is trying to help people be productive and, and really focusing on the outcome. So rather than just trying to sell licenses and whatnot, as mm-hmm. you're talking about, it's really, you know, you've got these tools at your hands. How do you help make that work? So if right. anybody needs help with a new format of working, we've been doing it for 10 years. We know how to do it. We know what works. We know what doesn't. We're here right. to help you. We're not going to charge you money to help you understand how to do remote work. Mm-hmm. We just want to help, right? Right. And I think there's also, and I, and I see a lot of companies stepping up and, you know, extending terms and trials and, you know, doing things for free or, you know, huge discounts to make it easy. And that stuff's all great. Um, but I think there's also a fine line as a company too, of not overextending yourself sure. too. Sure. You right? have to be cash so, positive. Sure. Right. It's because, yeah. you know, I think that 
if you're not if you're not too careful, that could you know put you out of business. Well, going back to the marketing market leading programs aspect of things, if you think about it, one of the other key fundamental pieces is that you know I've worked with all shapes of, uh, and sizes of companies. I've worked with Fortune 50 companies. I've worked with small mom and pop shops that had ten or less people. Uh, and, and in all cases, I've, I've worked with different formats of financing. I've seen VC back. I've seen PE. I've seen self-funded. I've mm-hmm. seen angel investing. So, I mean, I've worked with all manner of companies in all shapes and sizes. And invariably, what I find is those that are fiscally minded to begin with uh, are the ones that do well. So, for instance, with us, we're focused on burn rate. We've always been focused on burn rate. We've focused on keeping that cost structure low so that what we can do is pour in capital investment into high capacity team members and service mindedness. And we don't have to worry about trying to pay the bills as much, right? There's still bills you have to pay, Mm -hmm. but for us, we don't have to worry if sales take a, takes a 30% dip because guess what? We're taken care of, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, What we, what we found interesting is, is those companies that weren't well prepared going into this didn't just have a strategy problem. They had a fiduciary problem as well too, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, That's a huge problem. You look at the, uh, what was it? The CEO of Chase bank, I believe JP Morgan, JP Morgan Chase actually said, look, He's the only CEO at a bank that was there during the 2008 recession. He said, you can't go into this Mm -hmm. thinking that you're going to create a strategy on the fly. You have to know what you're going to be doing ahead of that. You have to have the processes and systems in place to be able to accommodate for that, right? So, uh, yeah, if you're not prepared going into it, it's going to hurt. It is. Yeah. And companies that were maybe struggling before, um, this is just going to fast pace something that was maybe going to happen anyway. Absolutely. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna really take and it's really gonna create what what I call a bifurcation. It's a big word basically, but this idea that you're gonna see stars shine and you're gonna see a lot of people fizzle out, right? Right, right. Yep. And so now something you mentioned, right? So creating these market leading programs extremely mm-hmm. important, mm-hmm. but aligning teams and people huge, huge. You you said those have to go together, right? Yep. So talk tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah. So for me, I've always been brought up uh, in, in th- there are two schools of thoughts. You, know, you can have your meat shop, as I call them, that basically churn people through. And, and that's certainly a business model. But I think for viability and for really what you see in the world that we will live in today, you have to be mindful of all of your stakeholders in the organization. That includes customers, that includes shareholders, right? We talk about shareholder value, but watch what's happening with public companies. There's a lot of pushback to make sure that you're taking care of your community and you're also taking care of those that take care of you, which are your, your employees, right? And so for us, we focus on the fact that if we can hire really high capacity individuals that have a heart and know what they're doing, then we can pour into those individuals and those individuals can form a team and that team can then pour into our customers and partner base. So I always like to say it, it has to do with mind, heart, and hands, right? You have to have a team that's focused on the can-do aspect, which is your, your mind. You have the mental capacity to do the job. Do you have the hands to do the job, right? Will, will, will you get in there and actually do the heavy lifting and, and get in there? And, and then do you have the heart, really, at the end of the day? And so that's, that's the idea is the attitude really sinks in and, and begins to position not just an individual to be successful, but gelling those individuals together as a team, you can accomplish exponential things. I mean, that's really John Maxwell's key tenet in a lot of his leadership talks, right, is about one plus one in leadership is not math that works. My job is to build other leaders in our organization. Everybody needs to be a leader so that I can have exponential success, right? Huge, huge deal. Every single successful Mm -hmm. program that has ever been built is built on the premise that you have a high capacity, high functioning team. Right. And what sort of techniques or tips do you have for, you know, finding these unique individuals? Cause I mean, yeah. they're, they're more rare than common. I'd imagine. They, they are. I mean, it's funny. I always used to joke around about the fact that people always used to applaud me for doing such a wonderful job. And I said, look, I'm just average. I just <laughs> happen to be better than all the other people you've ever run into. Evidently. Uh, I, I think really at the end of the day, there's a, there's a hiring process that I've been trained in that goes back into the 1950s. And it feels a little bit dated. And I will tell you that I work with software engineers and developers, and those guys come on and off the market so fast, it'll Mm -hmm. make your head spin. So getting somebody to participate in the hiring process is tough. But here's really the the, the secret sauce. 
it's hard work, right? It's, it's being savvy about it. So what's the process? What's the structure to do that? First and foremost, you have to be, you, you have to kind of find the right people. And a lot of time that's going to come from referrals. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you always have to be focusing on building out your referral network. That's why connections are really important. You have to have people that you trust that can refer people they trust to you and so on and so forth. Right. So then the second piece is, is you have to be really good at hiring these individuals and looking at them and you have a process that you go through. I tend to spend no less than 12 hours per candidate when I'm working with them. Right. So I, I'm going to start with a wide net, I'm going to narrow that down to a few candidates. I'm going to bring them through. Now, mm-hmm. after we go through the process that we go through to, to bring that person on. They should be very excited about what it is that we're doing. My job is I'm almost selling them on our company to the point where they really want to come work with us. And typically speaking, I can get people that uh, usually that are going to be, I I can attract folks that are higher capacity for less money because I have a total better package to offer them overall. Right. So I do have better benefits. I do. And the benefits extend to the fact that SciGen is really focused on, outcome focus. You know, mm-hmm. people are really struggling with remote work right now, right? Because of the fact that they, they feel like they're losing control. They feel like they can't put their thumb on the employee. They can't look across the table and see somebody working. But you well know this. Activity does not equal outcome, right? Not mm-hmm. necessarily. You have to really be savvy about that. So part of bringing this, this person on board is making sure that we're going to be outcomes focused, right? Then at that point, you've got them on board. You begin to integrate them. You're training them. You're grooming them. You're showing them how the culture works to be successful. Again, being outcomes focused, which quite frankly has been a big shift for a lot of people. A lot of people that that I bring into the company tend to have this mentality where they've got a manager that has a thumb on them and they feel liberated. They feel freed. They feel empowered. They feel valuable that I'm actually listening to them and asking them to make a decision. Right. So at that point, then you've got a team built, you've got a team that's beginning to work together. You give them common missions, goals and objectives to hit. You measure them and you hold them accountable. And then even more importantly, what you're doing is, is that you're applauding them. You're giving them, uh, you know, high fives and kudos for the work that they're doing, Mm -hmm. because I'm not the one that's doing the hard work. I'm not the one that deserves any applause. It's all them. Right. Mm -hmm. So very servant minded in that regards. And then finally, last but least, the one thing I have time and time again been shown is you've got to get the bad apples out. There's not bad Mm -hmm. people, but you have to get people that are not a good fit, not good producers out of your organization because they will suck your time. And more importantly, they suck the morale out of your team, right? Mm. That's how you build a great team. It's not magic. It's a lot of hard work. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So let's go back for a second. So 12 hours is 12 hours just that you spend in the recruiting process. Uh, that, that's what I spend in the interview process with in the interview right? process. So it's not including all the time I'm looking at resumes. That's not right. including the screening interviews, right? That's including what I'm, what I'm, and I'm doing this remotely. Most of the time, this is, this is a new thing for me for, right. for the last probably three or four years. Uh, I'm not used to hiring people remotely as much. And that's presented an interesting challenge because I'm used to sitting across the table over dinner, having dinner with a candidate, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So having that time though is really critical because here's the goal. I'm asking they're telling and they're building trust in me by them telling me because I'm actively listening and interested in them as a person. I'm not just interested in them and what they can do for me. I'm interested in how they can be successful. And that right. shows we have to be sincere about that. Yeah. And I mean, equally on their end, right. As a candidate, if they're showing up and continuing to put in the time at the end of that, you know, they really want it. Absolutely. Right. And it's hard because developers, I mean, I've had the last five developers I've hired have had multiple job offers when they come across the table, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and I'll, I've worked with recruiters. I've worked with, uh, you know, one-on-one developers that were referrals and you have to watch out because recruiters will get in there and they'll try to mix it up a little bit and try mm-hmm. to position you and say, well, they've got these other offers on the table. You need to hurry up and they'll create a sense of urgency, which is what their job is. But right. that's not how I roll, right? Right. And I think that obviously people that see you putting the time in are going to value that, right? Absolutely. Okay, so so 12 hours through the interview process, right? And then investing in them tremendously when they come on board, making Absolutely. sure that they have, a, you know, proper training, success, investment. And then something that you said that I found really important too is, you know, giving them kudos and high fives and and encouragement as they go along, right? Really giving them credit, which is probably a 
easier done in an office space where you're seeing them more frequently rather Possibly. than remote working, right? So I think that that's a really valid point that, you know, while people all are working at home, leaders need to be continuing to invest in their team, sure. giving them kudos, letting them know they've done a you know good job. Um, and what are some things that you found work well uh, to continue that, which is normal for you guys as a remote team? Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's huge. So, you know, uh, an old uh, coach of mine used to tell me uh, that you, you don't get quality time without the time, right? So you have to really be focused on investing the time. So what I try to do is tier the organization out to where I'm spending one-on-one -on -one time with my leaders every single week. My leaders now are obligated to make sure they're spending time with their team every single week. So they've got a 30 minute to hour slot, depending on what they feel like they need mm -hmm. per employee, right? So per team member, you've got weekly carved out time as a leader that you're having to spend with your team. We also bring together, you know, a, a full team format every single week and those kind of change. Now, here's a couple of the other things that we do is we're really big believers in instant messaging and, and virtual communications. We use right. MS Teams. We've used others before. MS mm -hmm. Teams is just what we use because we're, we're a Microsoft Gold partner and, and we, we do work with Microsoft a lot. So, um, for us, we do daily standups. Those daily standups are really big to keep the tempo in the organization. So what I'm doing is I'm establishing a cadence, right? Mm -hmm. People are plugged in, people are listening, people are engaged. That's the whole goal. And then the, the combine that with the fact that I've got the layer of the one-on-one -on -one time that people are spending with stuff. And then we combine that with the fact that we're spending weekly meetings together as a team, making sure that it's, it's a crisp bullet format for what people, so we're not spending an hour on the phone, just draw, droning on and on about whatever's happening in hmm. our lives. Uh, we, we focus on exactly what we need to do. We're mission oriented, we're outcome oriented. And so then what we do is, is we pour on, uh, you know, attaboys, right? So we've got a channel that's built around kudos and high fives. We've got company announcements. We've got emails. We just did our Azure go live yesterday internally. And I, I posted several messages about that. You know, we, we celebrated the two team members that were leading. I did special recognition for the development team that was working on the project as well too. And the entire company pours on. We had 15, 20 mm -hmm. people within the space of an hour saying, man, I really appreciate what you did. And here's why I appreciate what you did. Right? So there's, there's this great company interaction that we use the technology platform and over communicate and simulate a real world environment, right? Yeah. It's not walking up and shaking somebody's hand, which obviously got to do elbow bumps these days. Right. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's, it's pretty darn good. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I love that. Um, yep. I'm actually, I'm going to go create a high five Slack channel right now. There you go. That's it. Man. <laughs> high fives. That's exactly it. I am yeah. all every month I'll do what's called a Scotty award. So, you know, Scotty from Star Trek, giving her all she's yeah. got. So I'm, I'm always trying to find somebody in the organization to say, look, this person, it, it's hard because quite frankly, I've got, you know, we've got 40 employees that, that are just all the time giving it all they got. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it, it gets to be kind of, you know, a fun competition trying to figure out who to give that to every and why, but there's usually one or two people in the organization that that month they did something just again, over and above what was normal. So you can tell I get excited about that kind of stuff because man, I love patting people on the back and saying you did a great job, right? That is great, yeah. So uh, we're gonna take a quick second just to acknowledge what we do here at Monster VoIP. We help companies save 30 to 50% off their current business phone bill while providing them more value and more features. If you'd like to learn more, you can text us at 424-378-6966. Uh, Ken, we've talked a lot about creating these market leading programs and aligning team and people. And mm -hmm. now we're going to talk about scaling up and exiting. Absolutely. And yeah. so tell us of, of your experience of working with teams that you've built these programs, you know, built these teams and then scaled them up to exit. Yeah. So, I mean, exit's a fun thing. And so scaling up is always fun for any company, any, any business owner, any executive always wants to grow. And any person that's part of a team always prefers being part of a team that's growing and exciting and full of energy versus one that's not. I've been part of you know, different companies and different parts of their life cycle. And so, again, going back to the concept of the beginning of the conversation with having the end in mind, it's always critical for owners, especially to have the exit in mind, right? So what is your exit strategy, whether that be something that, uh, you know, you want to build your company up to $100 million or $500 million or whatever the case may be, you know, what's your plan for getting there? Or do you want to hand that down to your son or daughter? Do you want to sell that to some other company? Do you want to be acquired by a large company? Who are your prospects, right? So, 
you don't want to just be scaling up for no reason. So the idea really is, is that, you know, if, if you're looking at this as a lifestyle business, that's probably not the conversation to have. Right. Mm -hmm. But uh, when it comes to scaling up, what you're going to be focused on is you're, I'm, I'm really big into harmonizing and orchestrating people, process and technologies. Right. So we talked about having high capacity teams. You've mm -hmm. also got to apply technology smartly and you've got to really invest in automation inside of your organization. That is mm -hmm. absolutely critical. That's one of the reasons I joined SciGen was because they are so so good at helping automate processes and reduce the manual touch. So either you can reduce headcount to help save on your bottom line costs, or you can repurpose those individuals to other high value opportunities within your organization either way, right? So you can be humanistic or you can be capital focused either way you want to do it or even both some cases. So that's really key, right? You also have to make sure that as uh, Michael Gerber talked about in E-Myth Revisited is, is that most people associate process with driving the soul out of a business when in fact really what process is is that it's driven by the people in the organization the people tell the process what to do and the process thereby is organic and living and changes and evolves just like we do as a country just like we do as, right. as an entity right so really having said all that what we've done is is that you know over the years i've focused many companies and without people without process without technology there is no scaling up there mm -hmm. is no achieving scale to get you to be attractive to the exit strategy that you're looking for right yeah. so in, in the end that's what i've really helped companies focus on in my consulting practice years back was that you know i helped them try to understand how to harmonize all those aspects in their business to achieve whatever exit that was, whether it was handoff to the next level of management so they could retire, mm -hmm. whether it was handing to a son or daughter, whether it was selling to another company or whatever the case may be. Okay. Now tell me in working with these different organizations mm -hmm. um, of different sizes, right? With different mm -hmm. goals. Um, what are some of the commonalities that you find that you have see, you know, common lack of tech adoption of technology, lack sure. of efficiency and process sure. um, that are kind of like the first places that you look where, you know, there's probably opportunity to improve. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's always, it's funny because I, I, I always laugh. I don't, I don't mean to be um, too, too derogatory, but it was funny because I was dealing with some French customers at one particular point in time. And these French technology resellers believe that they were so different than everybody else in the mm -hmm. world. And it's a very common thing is we believe that we're not, we don't have the same problems and same issues that other people do. Right. And, and I was laughing with them a little bit. And, and, you know, I said, I just dealt with this with a Swede customer last week. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and same thing in the U S we have very similar issues. So the key things that I've always looking at in, in when I was consulting with and working with companies is number one, fiscal management, right? That's number one. Do you have a good, strong PL? Do you, do you have a way to track and measure things? Are you sharing your metrics with your management team so they can help drive that, that vision, right? You, I mean, as an entrepreneur and owner, you've got the vision. You know, do you have a way to measure whether you're achieving your vision or not? That's number one. You have to have a strong balance sheet. You have to be focused on having a good balance sheet. So as you move past that, that fiscal management, one of the common areas that I see often is in marketing. In marketing, people don't often understand really how to uh, be explicit with the problem they're solving and the pain that they're solving. Okay, They don't understand mm -hmm. who their customer is. They're, they're, they're vomiting all over their customer. And that sounds like a nasty term to use, but that's exactly what's happening is they're just vomiting all over them and hoping, right. they, hoping the customer buys something. That's terrible. So really what you have to do is understand the pain. That's another key point is you're not understanding your go. You don't have a go to market alignment. Uh, and kind of a subtopic there is what channels you're going, whether it's direct or indirect or whatever the case may be. That's mm -hmm. a whole other topic. Th then you kind of move into the next level of business. When you're growing, you're going to have certain gates you run through. And I see this happen all the time when you're a good example I see is when you're cresting about $10 million or so in revenue, uh, you know, possibly 20, uh, you've got a huge gap between sales and delivery. There's that middle piece, that implementation piece that you're always falling down on every single time. So mm -hmm. as you grow your company, you need to make sure that your delivery is matching your promise that you're making in sales, right? Mm -hmm. And then finally, what we're missing is on the tail end of it with operations and profitability is you need to be, make sure you're, number one, optimizing your, your operations for true profitability, right? Your repeatable processes need to be automated as much as possible to deliver bottom line profit to your organization. And then secondarily, you need to make sure that you're extending inside of your base. So if you've got multiple lines of business, first of all, you should have multiple lines of business. Why don't you if you don't? But mm -hmm. if, if you have multiple lines of business, invariably what I have seen in customer uh, analysis is that 
your customers may be well happy with you with the one product line that you're seeing, but majority of the time, you only see about 5% of your customer base fully layered and penetrated as I would talk about, right? Mm -hmm. So if I've got three lines of business, 95% of my customers only have one line of business that makes them extremely at risk for predatory uh, poaching. That also makes them extremely at risk for defection if they choose to be unhappy with that one product. So those Mm -hmm. are the big ones. Wow. Okay. And I like, I think that's, that's super important is if you have multiple lines of business, you know, why aren't you trans, you know, why aren't you messaging that properly to the 95% of your customers that are only using that one line of business, right? Um, Awesome. So we're just, we're just about out of time, but before I let you go, uh, thanks so much for your time and welcome to the Monster Chats community. Thank you. Um, but tell us a little bit more about Saijin and, and, and where people can find you or get more information. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to. So uh, at Saijin, we've been here for over two decades now, helping make a difference in the world. We've got customers large and small. And one of the things that I like to tell people is, is that we help you work the way you want, right? So we help customers automate processes, extract useful data off of the documents that they have and route those to wherever they want. So basically, if, if you have a problem trying to get information where you need it to go, give us a call. We'll help you out with that. Uh, and, and also on top of that, during this really challenging time, the folks really need help understanding how to work in a remote work environment. It, we're happy to help. And just let us know how we can help with you. If you want more information, you can go to SciGen.com, which is uh, P-S-I-G-E-N.com. You can also look me up on LinkedIn. I'll be happy to talk with you and spend time with you. But Colin, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking time. And I really want to make sure that uh, your, your audience is thanked as well, too, for uh, you know making sure they're out there every day scrapping it out. I mean, they make it happen. Yeah. Thanks again, Ken. Really appreciate it. Um, If you are listening to the podcast, please subscribe, review, share. We welcome your feedback. The show is all for you. So we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Colin. Take care. Thank you for tuning in for another episode of Monster Chats, presented by Monster VoIP, where we share the tools, methods, and best practices that business leaders use to build new connections, strengthen relationships, and impact sales in organizations of all shapes and sizes. If you have any questions from today's show and want to reach us directly, please text your question to 424-378-6966.